I guess that's why maybe with a higher play account, it starts getting more thinky, you know, because you really have to factor in play order. And the way player order works as well is, is very interesting as well, because the starting player changes and, and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a solid Euro that can, can become slightly vicious during one aspect of the game. Like a lot of Euro games have that, you know. Where did Ray okay. go? Ray has disappeared. Excellent. This is some fun ones here. Uh, Jenny's got St. Peter's book, which we haven't played since the second edition breaking occurred, which we'll talk about. Uh, Andy's got Carum or Crokinole, which is awesome. William's got the classic Catan. He's bringing the classics. And I've got Suburbia, which is definitely not a new game, but one that I really enjoy. So take it away, the person that managed to break the game. Jenny. Yes. So I, I like the theme of this. Uh, I wrote a master's thesis on Russian history. So at any time you get like medieval Russian and any, any type of Russian history, I'm usually like, I'm willing to play. I'll, I'll try that. And so uh, I, I really like that. I mean, is, is the theme super important? No, it's not. But you know, it adds a, a fun little thing for me. Um, the second edition came with this really cool market that unfortunately doesn't work two player, which really kind of sucks. But um, it's a really neat game. And it's really neat because you're building a tableau. It's a tableau builder. Um, and you're getting your workers. And then you're in different phases, different parts of your tableau go off. And, you know, in general, you only get money in certain ones and others are more where you're spending money. Well, how we managed to break the game was I got the two cards that pretty much gave me money every single phase, which normally never happens. And I managed to, we've never seen this, I managed to pretty much buy every card. Usually you've got, you know, you buy one or two cards and the rest come down and some fall off. Nope, I bought like every card available and we have never seen it happen. And I looked at Ray and go, well, do we want to just quit? It's like, no, I want to see how far this can go. Because I was getting like 70 rubles or like 100, I mean, just like this ridiculous number that was totally, like we'd never like triple, quadruple what we'd normally gotten. Um, and he's like, yeah, we're, I'm never letting you get that combo again. But uh it's really fun. Uh, it's a really neat tableau. It, it feels different than a lot of other games in that. And then when you add in the market, which is another interesting mechanic, when you get over that three player, it adds even more complexity to that tableau you're building. So I really enjoy St. Petersburg. Um, and we'll get it back to the table um, now that Ray hopefully is over the breaking of the game. Oh, I enjoyed that game. You had every card in front of you. You you had basically each of the decks. I wanted. I did. I was like, no, we're not stopping. See if you can get them all. <laughs> I just keep going. Fill the table. Um, all the other plays that we've had with it have been excellent, and that one was still that was unique. But it it was a it's really a fun game. I like it. Tableau building is is great. All right. There you go. And I even found a picture for you. Oh, you did. So that is actually the, uh, the Kara, one of the carom boards that I have. I have multiple carom boards because I have a problem. Uh, I love dexterity games, and I am not shy about my love of dexterity games. And carom, uh, the, the, the version, there's a, multiple versions of carom. It, it exists all over the world. Um, the most popular uh, version of carom is probably in India, to my understanding, and it's a little different than American carom uh, in terms of rules and in terms of components. In India, they use wooden discs, uh, and what we have in American carom is these plastic discs. And basically, um, it is shrinking uh, billiards, uh, or it's, it's like a, it's like a, a, a mix of snooker and pool, except you're flicking rings around a board, either with your finger or you can see those two little sticks. Um, and to give an idea of, of scale, I think it's about two and a quarter feet aside square. Uh, and then you have these nets in the corner. And so you have to get your pieces in, you have to, uh, there's a, a piece, uh, most pieces are worth one point and there's a piece that's worth three points. Usually you get points for leaving, for getting all of your pieces off the board, and then you get points for all the pieces your opponent leaves on the board, and then you reset and you play to a set 
point tally. There's also a different colored piece that's called the queen uh, and you have to sink the queen and then sink one of your pieces after the queen or the queen is unpocketed which is a similar mechanic in, in a lot of, of billiards and, and pool type of games. Um, it's super fast, it's super accessible, uh, it's really fun, um, it's very easy to teach, it's very easy to play uh, and you can play it, you can play it with little kids, you can play it with adults and, it, and the more you play it the more fun you have playing it, I think, because it does get more challenging and you also figure out, you know, you get some of the mechanics of, of angles. You can't do the same thing you can do in a game of pool where you can put spin on the pieces uh, as well to, to control the English of where the, where the little rings are going to go. Um, so I don't like that as much. Um, but you know, my guy who has a full-size pool table in his house. Uh, it's it's dis dis disassembled right now because I don't have a place to put it. But uh, pool is one of my loves, and this kind of lets me scratch that itch in a, in a smaller board game type of format. Um, and I'm a sucker for dexterity games. I'm not necessarily very good at them, but I'm a sucker for them. I think I've played this at your place, Andy. Right. I've inflicted this upon many of my friends, William. I think I have no. inflicted it upon you. <laughs> no, I really liked it. And I think you also win the award for oldest board game with Crokinole because it's from like the 1800s. <laughs> Crokinole is magnificent as well. I mean, Crokinole is basically uh, like shuffleboard, right? Uh, it's it just an, in a small board and it is an, a very old game. And it is really, really fun. And you can get this board that, that the picture is of is made by the American Carom Company, which is where most people get their Carom boards in the, in the US. And it comes with a little rule book that has rules for like 50 different games you can play on this board. Uh, and the backside of this board is a Crokinole board. Uh, so you play, that's why, that's why I had it listed as both, because you can play both with all the components you get in one box from the American Carom Company. You can also get, there are, you know, the Crokinole is, is, is there's places in, in the U.S. where it's a pretty big thing, and they have tournaments, and you can get a really fancy, beautiful, handmade wood uh, Crokinole board, should you desire it. Um, I know one of the guys in Anchorage in our, in our board game group uh, bought one from a Kickstarter last year that I was very envious of, but you know, uh, it's not, it, the, the, I think the hardest part about this game is that you can't always talk everybody into doing it. And it's a rather large game for a two player game. So <laughs> it does take up a good deal of space. Uh, I've never not had fun playing it. Uh, and I, I feel like the people that I've introduced it to have all enjoyed learning to play it and, and the challenge of it, even if it hasn't been quite their particular cup of tea. Oh, definitely. We played that at at MJ's for like six hours. <laughs> that was that was funny because I brought it just being like, I don't know if this is going to be good, but a friend of mine gave me this board. Um, <laughs> a friend of mine who's a teacher had bought it for his fifth grade class, and it was too much for his fifth graders to be interested in. They just didn't have their, I think, had he had the right fifth graders, it would have taken off, but he didn't, didn't have them or didn't sell it the way he should have or whatever. But regardless, he's like, here, take this board. I don't want it. And I was like, well, yeah, okay. I, I'll always take a free board game. Then I went out and got a board because the one he, he gave me was a little a little busted up. And that's the one I brought to MJ's to try with Ray. And I think that's the only game we played that whole night. Like it was because we were just having so much fun. It was it was just really fun. It was really light. It was really quick paced um, and it was challenging. Um, and I don't feel like either of us really had an edge at all that nope. whole whole and then that's the thing like i've played i've played this game with a bunch of different people and i feel like i know there's an element of skill to it but it's just fun it's just fun yep. to flick those little discs around the around the board i'm really glad you would it, first of all it looks really cool um i'm glad you include this because i think like we didn't rank though we play it all the time is pinochle and canasta i play those games constantly um, I play so many of the classics, I just don't think to rank them on my list, and I probably should because, I mean, we, we play Pinochle all the time with our family, Euchre with Ray's family, and we love those games, and those classics, they're classics for a reason, they're just that good, or you, William, with chess, you know, okay. it, it's like, th there's a reason they're still around, and I think that it's important that people are like, oh, just because I, we just played a, a really cool board that we just, we learned over the holidays was Pegs and Jokers. I don't know if you played it, but it's really no. cool because it's pretty much sorry fixed. But they make these really in-depth boards. I think Ray's talking about he might try his hand at the woodworking to make us one. My aunt and uncle have a gorgeous board that they had handmade by someone. And it's just really cool because it's 
someone took sorry and it seems like it fixed sorry it's like sorry with real rules so it's interesting william and i actually had a discussion about this this week because we coach chess together william helps me coach the elementary uh, chess team at my club uh or at, my, at my school and um we talked about whether to include those very traditional games because when i because well, the game my wife and i play the most together is it, depending on the year either cribbage or backgammon and we play them both on repeat. And I think probably, you know, my favorite game, period, is probably backgammon. Like I just love that game. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting right here. I look. I have three backgammon boards up on my shelf because I have a habit of finding backgammon boards at thrift shops and cobbling together functional backgammon boards and then giving them to people so they can go play backgammon. I love the game that much. Um, and I love chess. I'm not. I'm not a competitive chess player. Uh, by any means, but I love the game. I and I think, <clears throat> I think I didn't feel like those kind of fit this list very well. Um, I feel like Carom I can sneak in because it's a dexterity game, um, and I and I almost well, you know I I, I joked that if Carom wasn't okay, if Carom was out of bounds because it's not a it's a more traditional game, then I'd recommend Dutch Blitz. But Dutch Blitz is very much a traditional type of card game, you know, uh, but a fantastic game. But yeah, I, um, I, yeah, I, I almost didn't put this on, but I thought, yeah, you know, I love this game. I absolutely love it. It's so much fun. Yeah, I think it belongs in, on the list. I, I took out, for instance, uh, chess and poker, because I don't think, even though they are games, one's a card game, the other one's a board game, but they're, they're not quite in this type of hobby, right? You can have people who play chess who have never, ever played any other board game or similar to poker, right? So I, I feel that the kind of like what, what the hobby is, you know, maybe it's a like, bit like a, has a social aspect to it. I feel that they're a bit disjoint, you know, so that's why I took chess out and I took poker out as well, because they would have been featured very high up on my list. But I feel that that Crokinole kind of belongs there, you know, Carom as well. I don't know. Yeah, I think that that was kind of the, the bar you and I talked yeah. about a little bit was that if it was a game that you might not have a collection of board games, but you have this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean any of those games are bad games. Yeah. Those are wonderful games. But I felt like this list is more about, you know, like I, I, all of us have large game collections with many, many games with many that are very complicated. Um, and sometimes what I, what I love about Karam and Crokinole so much is they're simple. They're not complicated. Yep. That's what I love about a lot of dexterity games is that, they have amazing components and they're really fun and they're fun on the table and they're fun to play, but they're not super complex. You don't need to sit down and you don't, you don't just figure it out halfway through your second playthrough. You know, um, I, that's one of the things I really like about it. It's very easy to grok, you know, uh, chess is, is much deeper than that, but also, um, I don't know. It's one of those, uh, like pure information games, right? Is that, that's what they're, they're yep. called. Every, every, variable is known and I love a little bit of randomness in my in my solid variables which I think is why I love uh, dexterity games so much because you can just totally flub a shot <laughs> and you should have made it and you should be winning the game and instead you've just lost and I, I, I love that about this game and about other dexterity games we're gonna go left no you aren't <laughs> all right William Catan Oh boy. Okay. So, I mean, this is the most classic of the classics, right? It's the, the game that bridged Germany and the United States, right? Um, yeah. I mean, what can I say here, right? It came out in 95 and I believe uh, the stories of in like the board gaming conventions of, of here, the U.S., someone having German copies of Catan and selling them in the, in the back of their car or something like that. And no one could read the rules because they were in German and there were people trying to get, you know, translators to translate the rules which were in German because they were still very much separate markets and Catan really bridged that, you know, okay, it was the game that, you know, made Americans turn towards more Euro games, right? And um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've played this game way too much because the digital implementation of it is just really good in Catan Universe. It's the official uh, implementation of it done by, you know, the, 
the 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 the, the Toiba family, you know. And uh, I've played it over the digital version over 700 times online. Yeah, because it's just very streamlined. I think it's a, one of the best digital implementations of, of board games. And I like it because it's very elegant, but very strategic. And there's a lot of resources on theory for it available. Because when the pandemic hit, I was like, I was getting frustrated with chess because playing chess online, there's the problem of people cheating in slow games. Because nowadays your, comp your, your phone can beat a, a, the, the, the world champion at chess. And I was all, a lot of times seeing that people were cheating online on chess because they're just pulling out their phones and, and making the phone calculate their moves, right? And so I wanted a different game to dedicate myself to, which was a tournament game. And I was like really divided between Catan or Hive, which will show up in my list later on. But Catan has a lot of online resources for you to learn the deeper aspects of the strategy, which is, which is why I chose it, you know, and just got addicted to it because, like I said, the digital version, the implementation is, is so good. So I've, I'm right now in Catan Universe, which is the, the biggest platform, which has like half a million people, at least half a million people. I'm ranked in the top 300 players of Catan because I've played it, I've played it over 700 times, you know. And uh, my milestone was when my rank, when I get into the top 100, when my ranking goes, my ELO rating goes to 1300 roughly, um, I'm gonna stop, <laughs> no more, you know? But it's hard, man, cause I'm at 1290 and it's just like 10 points away, man. And then you go and you play and you, your, your, your numbers don't roll and what can you do, right? I mean, yeah, I think, you know, if you want to dive into a game, dive into the strategy and learn like deeper elements of the strategy, there's a lot to be done in Catan. Like even though I've played 700 games, I'm still learning things, but it's very much very nuanced stuff. Like to which degree is, you know, uh, a synergy between two to uh, resources worth more than a higher value of production. It can get very nuanced, but, but, but it's, it's very deep in that sense, you know? So I can get it because if you want like casual play, it can wear itself out, you know? But if you want to dive in, that's one that you can really dive in. I was thinking of diving into Dominion as well, because that's, that's another one that has a lot of resources out there for the theory. But the thing is to play a tournament of Dominion, they play with all the expansions and I don't own all the expansions now, right? So Catan just has everything you need. That's just like the base game there. It's like endless depth, you know? So that's why it's uh, uh, on my list because what I want to do actually is play it with people because I want, because I'm being playing online too much and the digital version, for instance, it tells you how many, it really shows you how many development cards the other people have, right? And so uh, it, it, says, it, it says a little number there, it counts how long their roads is. So you can be, get kind of, uh, used to that and when you play online and when you play in real life you forget to pay attention to how many cards development cards people have how long their roads exactly are so i just wanted to play uh, uh, with people a bit more to to get more of the tabletop feel for it something that happens with chess as well if you play chess uh, on the computer a lot and you go play it on a real board you'll be like whoa it's 3d oh my god you know so that's why I kind of like want to play with people as well, because uh, so that I can not rely so much on things that the digital version does for you, you know. And uh, yeah, I did not explain how to, what the game is or how it plays, because do I, should I? I don't know. I think you're good. It's Catan. I, right. I think that one. We, we've all got animals crawling all over us. Um, <laughs> This is, this is Harley. She also loves Catan, as every other human on uh, and, and female on Earth probably does. Catan was my gateway game into gaming, uh, mm -hmm. and I played innumerable evenings of Catan. And um, I love. I was going to ask you, William, do, do you play just the core game, and at what player count is the online community playing? Because I, for me, um, I am more. I I enjoy Catan. There's a specific expansion I love and a specific player count I love. <laughs> and it's it's not the, the vanilla game for me. Yeah, I think you like Citizen Knights, right? 
That's my favorite by far. Cities and Knights at six. I think that's so, the that's for me the ideal player count and expansion for Catan. But that's just my play style and what I like to to mess with. So the deal is is that the implementation from Catan Universe has. I'm not going to say all the expansions because I don't think it does have all the expansions, but it has a lot of expansions. It has Cities and Knights, it has the Seafarers expansions, I think it has the Inca expansions. And um, for the base game, you can choose to either play it with three or four players, right? And uh, I'm guessing with the others, you can also have variable player count as well. You know, and you can you don't need to play it against people. A lot of times, you can just play it against uh, the, the the bots, basically. You know, it also has an option which I, I kind of see why some people choose is that you don't play with dice necessarily. What you get is a deck of cards that has the correct distribution of of the numbers, right? It's because sometimes you can have like terrible rolls, right? But having those deck of cards means that the number eight will show up the number of times that it should, basically. Or the number six will show up more than the number four, right? So it has lots of little different variants as well. There's the so-called friendly robber variant as well that they've implemented, where um, you can't place a robber on someone that only has two points so that you don't cripple them from the very beginning, you know? So there's, there's a lot of customization that you can do on the Catan Universe implementation. There are other implementations as well. There's one called, it's, it's a, it's a browser-based one called colonist.io, which a lot of the pros play there because you, you, it's easier to get longer games in. But it's not as pretty, it's not as well designed. It's just like, I could never like go through like, I'm gonna have to learn what all these buttons are because it's, it's not intuitive because it's not the official one. So if you go on the Catan Universe one, they definitely do have Cities and Knights because I've played it, you know. And I think you can probably choose the play account, whichever play account you want. Right. What might be a problem is finding people to play it. That variant, be, right. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd be inter I want to replay this. I want to replay the core Catan because mm -hmm. um, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't played the core Catan in, years i don't even remember the last time i played just the basic Catan. because for me after a certain point all i played mm -hmm. was cities and knights at the higher player counts and um it's a, i mean i don't know that anyone it, it's it is a classic it is the very definition of a board game classic and i love all all of the iterations of it i have enjoyed i don't like seafarers as much as some of the other ones mm -hmm. um just because the the game length is so long on seafarers sometimes just because of the the randomization of it Oh, and I just, I, I love seafarers. I love that exploration of you get to flip over and like the different, like the stuffs and fog. So I don't play Catan Universe. I, I see William on Steam all the time popping up. He's playing. But I play the app on my Kindle. Um, and it's kind of annoying because the trading, the, the way they do trading is, oh my God, I'd like to kill the computer. But I just play against the computer AI and I play. But it only, it does cities and nights. And Vanilla has a bunch of different like versions, but it doesn't, and Seafarers, but it doesn't have, I, I kind of wish it had more in it, but um, I play that all the time. Ray hates it, um, but uh, because of, of the way the trading works, but uh, it, uh, the, the computer is incredibly stupid on that one, just with the trading. Like, do you want this? No, I don't want that, but anyways. Um, I really like it. I, I do. I love seafarers because I like to. We've played a lot of playing Catan because Andrew, our 10 year old, has gotten into it. And we play base Catan with the kids. And it works really well for both of them because what I think works for them is that even when it's not your turn, you're getting stuff. And so it feels like it's always your turn, even though it's not. And it works really good with the kids because they always feel involved even when it's not their turn. And so we've had really good luck with the kids with, with base Catan. We have not had very good luck. I, I'd be interested, Andy, to play Cities. I love Cities and Knights. I'd love to play Cities and Knights at six players with you because Ray and I have played Catan at five to six, and he has swore we will never play five to six player Catan again. Really? Um, so uh, he just, it was not a good experience. But I think there was a lot of factors to why it wasn't a good experience, 
but uh, he, he swore never five to six again. And we don't have any of the five to six expansions. We have Cities and Knights. We have, you know, Seafarers. But we don't have the five to six player expansions. Well, I'll, I'll, I'd like I'll bring to try over, it. I'll bring over the Cities and Knights. Five. I, I have all of the – I have Seafarers. I have Cities and Knights. I have the core game with all, all with the five and six player expansions. Um, <clears throat> I actually haven't bought the newer versions of Catan because the game didn't change substantially. Just the graphic design did. Um but yeah, I I, th I think a huge piece of Catan, which I found with a lot of games like like Sheriff of Nottingham, is really really fun if you have the right group of people. But if you're playing with an honest group of people, that game's not much fun at all. And so I think Catan, like Catan, where Catan struggles is sometimes in who you're playing it with. I've, I've played um, a, a good friend of mine, his wife and uh, his his wife's brother and and uh, his wife will they're basically a team. And so it's two people playing to make one person win, which is maddening. Uh, and of course, you're like, no, no, that's not how we're playing. But it's like, yes, that's, we are all watching you play. We know what's happening here. Uh, and so I think it sometimes it struggles from that in the human ex human interaction of Catan. But I also think that's where some of the most fun happens, too. So yeah, William, let's get this to the table, man. I love this one. Yeah, so why don't you guys like the five to six player uh, version of it? Why don't why don't I? Yes, I would probably you... say it is the the human experience of that one. When the, you know when over half of the the group is so worried about, you should always try and play to win. But that shouldn't you shouldn't be worried about it. So you had half the group trying to win. You had one person like really pushing to win, like to the point where they had analysis paralysis. And then we had one person. That just wasn't a gamer. So the five to six mm. way it works confused them. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there going, this is Catan, and we are four hours into it. Uh, we Also, Viticulture, never again. Four or less. Never again more than four. I'm getting a list of them. There's five to six player games. Isn't it funny how some games just shine at that higher player count and some games are maddening at the higher player count? I actually think Catan, um, for me, why I like Cities and Knights more than the base game is that Cities and Knights takes care of that stuck in the end game forever problem. Just because there's more routes to victory, so you spend less time stuck at the end of the game in Cities and Knights typically. Not that you can't still get stuck there, but you don't, like oftentimes in Catan, there's that, that tension around the table of who's in the lead. And then, oh, no, don't trade with that person because if you trade with them, they're going to win. Like, they're only one point away. I've done the math. I know the, how close they are. Don't give them that sheep because they're going to win, mm -hmm. you know. And so then you have that. And it's fun sometimes when you're that person who's that one sheep away from winning because then you're just really trying. It, it's just a great game all the way around. But, yeah, I think the, the social element, just like with any game, really makes a, a big piece of it. Well, and I think that, uh, you know, also with the five is, is that – I, I understand to make the robber, because if you didn't have the, you could build after everyone's turn on the five to six players, the robber would decimate you. Just, it, it would. Like, I understand why it's there, but it was, it really, that extra step of just slowed us down so bad, it just didn't work. But, you know, honestly, now that we've been playing with the kids, even Ray's admitted it's been fun with the boys. Like, I think he's kind of, and I love all the expansions. I have most of, I don't have actually base Catan on my list, but I have the Catan histories. I love Catan Geographies Germany. I love Rise of the Incas. Um, I love the Egypt expansion. I like all those versions of it because I really like the different flavors of it. Um, my favorite right now, I think, is Rise of the Incas. Um, and that might be Cult of the New, but I just really enjoyed that one. Um, but I do, and we've had some really good plays. We have the Santa expansion, and we played that at Christmas with the kids, and it was just a blast. So... Hang it's on, not fellas. going anywhere. I... Ray's stuck with it forever. I'll be back real quick. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so me, suburbia. I like SimCity. That's that's my entire explanation for the game. I like SimCity. Um, no, this one turned out to be great. We uh, we played this first time in a Panera with some friends of ours. And I loved it. The graphic design is good, clean, and ugly. It it reminded me of the Super Nintendo 
SimCity, where it's just an outline and it says restaurant. And you're like, okay, I'll put that there. But the interactions are great. And when do you spend your money to get that, that tile farther down that will help complete your city or where you put them matters. Um, we have the collector's edition. This is the only collector's edition that we've we've ever bought. And we we kickstarted the correct collector's edition um, because we played it that often and it gave so many tiles. And it's just, it's a fun game where you're trying to build a city. It's got a, a uh, path, so you're picking tiles, put them into your city. But what your opponents do also affect your city. So if I got a bunch of fast food restaurants, it's going to affect the the fancy restaurant over there because they're cheaper. Um, airports help a lot of things and really, really piss off the neighbors. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where where you put it matters, and you got to get a balance because you can put a bunch of stuff out for a lot of money, but then your population is going to go down because your city is a a, a factory wasteland with factories everywhere and it's just not a nice place to live i really enjoy this one so that that's suburbia for me this will be later in my list so i'll save all my comments for then yeah, and i have on... plenty of them <laughs> this is on my two playlist uh this this one has always looked really interesting to me and i also love SimCity, so i imagine i will like this too we're getting a good, for when we finally can get game nights back, we're getting a good list of games we want to play together. Indeed. Oh, William's list is going to get, get hit pretty pretty hard. That There's several that I, I definitely want to try. So we're going to move on to 14. 14 now. We got Andy with Dice Throne, William, Reichold, me going with the Legendary, and Jenny, One Small Step. So one of the things I've enjoyed about our, our, our list, by the way, before I get into Dice Throne, is there are games on here that you guys all love that I have never played. So I'm excited to play Reichold when we get a chance to, to do that. But uh, Dice Throne I discovered through Ray, um, and I don't have Season 1, but I have all of Season 2. And I've played all of Season 1, and it's just, I think, um, it's pretty close to the perfect filler game for me. Uh, it, it fits in real easy. It's very straightforward. It's deep enough that it it makes you think and, bur and burns your brain, but not so much that you're going to just walk away from it exhausted and not able to do any other deep thinking afterwards. Um, I like the the variability of it. I mean, there's there's six classes in the in each. Let's see. There's I think there's eight in season two. Are there eight in season one as well, Raymond? Is that right? Are there sixteen total? There there's. Um... And then there's the two more they added with the Kickstarter, yeah. right? With the Kickstarter, so now I think it's up to 16. It, it was six. six and then eight, and then they got the two. And I did Kickstart that, so I've I've got oh, the. Oh, so do you have the do you have the ninja and the uh, and the, what is the other one? The tree ant. Trent. Yeah. Trent. And uh, yeah, well, 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 I, I'm looking forward to trying their co-op uh, fight the game. Yeah, that looks interesting to me. I uh, I want to play that too. But I think Dice Throne is it's very accessible, and the the design, the game design, not so much on on the original season one game design, unless you got the Kickstarter. But the game does the just the implementation of the storage in the game trays inserts that are are in Dice Throne, uh, especially the season two. You, you know the two packs that they have at um, at Barnes and Noble. Like it's. The storage is brilliant. Like it, everything has a place. It all fits into a place, um, and the game is super smooth. It's fun to play with three. It's fun to play with four. It's it's best at two. Certainly, I think is where it shines. Um, but I I love it because it's got a little bit of something for everybody. If you just want to go and just be the tank, then go ahead and pick the barbarian. If you want to try to get fiddly and mess with everybody else's stuff, be the blood elf. Like there's uh, or the, the there's just so or maybe it's the moon elf. I don't remember what it is, but there's there's so many different ways to play it, um, but in the end, it's just very much a punch your opponent in the face as much as possible while playing fantasy Yahtzee. It's it's great. <laughs> Jen likes this one because you can actually defend yourself. You get a defense roll sometimes. 
I do like that. I, I get really frustrated in some of these, you know, attacky games where it feels like, okay, I can attack that person, but then when they're attacking me, I can't do anything back. And I, I don't know, I, it feels very one-sided sometimes in these games, and I like that this does have that mechanism. And you can up your defense just like you can up your attack rolls, and you can get better defense. I, I also did have to laugh, Andy, when you were talking about the storage, because you and Bray both are so... Like, I think sometimes a game, you can hate the game, but still decide you love it simply because the storage was so nice. It makes a difference. I think, so like, Terraforming Mars is on my list later, and Terraforming Mars is a magnificent game with the worst box management I have ever seen in my life. You just throw everything in a box. It's horrid because there's so many components and pieces. Um, and I think they've gotten better with it a little bit. But when I see a game that's so well designed, it's so easy to play, <clears throat> and the management is so is so simple, and, and it's just, I love the integration of the cards and the upgrading all of your abilities. And I love that you can pick a character where you can have a defense, but you can also pick a character where it's all offense and you don't care if you get hit or not. You just hope to kill the other person first. So I like that they have different play types to, or different, different characters to fit different play types. Um, and I, I just think it's really well designed, and I, I, it's just fun. It's always fast. It's always, it's, it's always. Uh, and I know William, I've gotten you uh, some of the dice thrown as well, because uh, you know, if I really love something, I share it with my friends. Yeah, I think we played the. Can't remember the, the the names of one is the one is the pirate, and the other is the, the that kind of engineer character. Pirate kind of. Queen and the yeah, I don't remember what he is. The artificer. Guy. Artificer. Artificer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. Uh, this one didn't make really my. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have uh, season one or a complete season. I just have like two characters, right? Which is why I just didn't quite make it into the top twenty-five of me. But th that's one that I'm definitely down to play at any time. Yeah, and I think the the part of the problem for this one for me is, and I have an, another couple mm -hmm. that it's just it's an expensive game, and it's expensive both in terms of of dollars that you'd have to spend to get the whole game, and it's also expensive in terms of how much shelf space you have to give up to this game. It's a it's a game that takes up a lot of space. Fun Funcoverse didn't didn't make my my top twenty, but um, that one, man, the problem is they keep putting out good stuff. Because the characters, are, I have the Kool Aid Man. We have Jaws, the Kool Aid Man, and the T Rex. That's Andrew's team right there. You can't ask for this. This game is is worth it. I love it. Um, and William. Yeah, so this has already shown up before. I right? already mentioned a bit about it. Again, greenhouses in Iceland, right? Worker placement and everything. And it's just like very pretty art, very nice gateway game into like worker placement. I've played this for people who have never played a Euro game before and they, they got it because it's sufficiently streamlined and, and simple. And, uh, and then you also have some like strategic uh, depth to it as well. You know, one thing that I'm, I, I've played this game very differently each time I've played it, not just because of the cards, but what I'm trying to, what, one strategy that I want to try out now is uh, kind of like a very long-term approach to things where I'm going to be behind for multiple turns and then I'm going to like slingshot uh, away where I'm just going to spend my, my first two terms, turns just buying greenhouses. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to buy greenhouses. While everyone is planting, I'm just like going to be the, going to have the monopoly of all the greenhouses. And then later on, I'll fill them up. And then the next turn, I'll just have, I'll be like the, the lord of all the vegetables, you know. So there's a lot to experiment, even though it's a simple game. So yeah, that, that's Reichhold. It does also make me want to go to Iceland. So, you know, there's that too. Yeah. I'll go with, uh, I will call you the king of vegetables if you pull it off. We will, we will get you a crown. It's hard, man, because you kind of like have this kind of like follow your nose strategy of get a greenhouse, get a vegetable, plant the vegetable, sow the vegetable, sell the vegetable, right? That's kind of what you're doing. But I'm like, what if I just spend my first turn just getting all the greenhouses? You know, I don't know. I'll see if I can pull it off. We've talked about this one. It is a deck builder. It is another one of the deck builders. Of all my lists, I have the deck builders. That's apparently what I like. But this one gives you options, and it really is 
There is one other one that I think gives a better co-op feel. And I think it was actually farther down on my, my list. I can't remember where uh, Harry Potter is. It feels more cooperative. But other than that, this one is just a blast. And we've played it a lot. Go ahead, Jen. Harry Potter was 72 on your list. So way, way down there uh, as a co-op. And I think the, the the number of themes definitely helps affect this and the, the compatibility. Um, but there's also not an end. You know, Harry Potter, we've played through all seven boxes. We've played through the monster boxes. We have the new expansion. And I think it's a great game. But this one, you always get the replayability. And there are so many expansions. You can pick. You, you like Spider-Man? Cool. Go get Paint the Town Red. You have all the Spider-Man guys. Now, what are you going to do? I'm going to play that. And all the key thing about that, if it's Spider-Man, it only costs you two to buy. Always. And then it, you can play it, and it plays off that. Um, it's just a great system. That's that's it. And and we do have the James Bond one. I got to get the expansions, though, so I can have all of the bonds. You, you got to have bonds. So you, you can mix them. They are all compatible. You can have Egg Shen mixed with Wolverine and, uh, you know, 007 um, Sean Connery, and you can put them in a team to take on Thanos. So, I mean, you, you got to take that into account. How can you not love that, Ray? Like, I mean, that's just, I just love that about about this game. And I love, like, my wife's favorite cartoon character or, or comic book character is Deadpool. So we got the Deadpool expansion. And, like, I think the whole point of the Deadpool expansion is to get chimichangas. <laughs> Which is such a Deadpool thing, and such so like we love it, like it, and it totally changes the. It's it plays off this brilliant core system, and just adds the flavor of whatever character they add to it or whatever story they add to it. And so I think it's they they've really done a nice job of iterating on this great core deck building system that they created. I would I would say the one thing with the legendary is that. It definitely has a longer setup than most deck builders, and it's longer to teach. I mean, once you've got it, it's not hard. And I, I know that, like, I'm sure you, Andy, too, and Ray has our box set up to the point where he can set up pretty quick. I'm um, in the play mat's help. But it's definitely when I'm considering what I'm teaching to someone who's new and maybe hasn't done a lot of deck builders, this is not a game I'm going to pull out. I'm going to pull out a Cryptozoic, which might not be as good as theme, but Cryptozoic is really easy to teach. There's, like... Okay, you got this. I, I got five minutes and I can have you playing Cryptozoics. So I, I spent a portion of my evening um, helping my wife's uncle sort and organize his legendary boxes. Not box, boxes. So I feel your pain. Uh, and it definitely is a longer setup than than uh, those Cryptozoic games. And even then, like like Dominion. And this is where like the, the some of the organization stuff comes in. Like Dominion is so easy to get out and set up. Like bam, 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 you're done. Um, but part of it too is like if we were playing my legendary set or Ray's legendary set, it would have taken a third the time to set up just because I have everything sorted alphabetically and labeled and it's all sorted masterminds are together, schemes are together, heroes are together. All, you know, it's all... Uh, so part of it's, you know, that's how my brain works. I love doing that. I, like, they were like, oh, we're so sorry you're sorting our legendary. And my wife was like, no, he likes this. This is something he enjoys. So don't, you don't have to apologize. I, the, we did, we were listening to a Dice Tower podcast and a tale of horror. Someone's entire box of sorted legendary fell out in their car and scattered everywhere. Nightmare. Absolute nightmare. Yeah, I agree. That's, a, that's definitely a tale of horror. I have to unmute. Okay. Um, so we're back to Academy Games, and <laughs> it's big shock here. I love the historical. So, again, this is the newest one, um, and this is the space race, and it really does feel like the space race. Um, and uh, like any Academy Games, the rule book sucks, just awful. And so it took us a couple of plays, but um, once we got it down, it's a great game. Again, the theme comes really through. It comes with all the teaching tools. So if you want to be teaching, you know, the space race as you go in, 
it, it wouldn't really work in the classroom setting. I think it just takes too much time and too hard to teach. But you know, for if you're a homeschooler or right now you've got kids virtually schooling, um, it's a great way to teach some history and uh, to bring it out. And just, uh, you know, it's one of those, I just can't get over enough how much I love all these Academy games. I mean, pretty much they put out a new game, we buy it, so. There's been a few that we've had to eventually give up, some of them me bawling over, but you know, it, it's not because I didn't need to give it up, it's because I didn't want to admit I didn't like it, but you know, that's a different story. Thirteen, and we break the, uh, the Euro streak here with William, and we go with Captain Sonar. I shift into a Euro-y style game with Islebound, Jen brings Agricola, still feed your people and do everything or, or pay the penalty. And then he brings Roll for it. <laughs> so go for it, William. Uh, Captain Sona, I think it's up here. Where is it? It's here on my shelf. This is a problematic entry because I own this game. I really want to play this game, but I have never played this game before. And we got it, and we need to really have the full experience. We need eight people to play it because you're playing. It's kind of like um, it, uh, what you call a battleship on steroids, basically, right? You each in a in a submarine. You have two teams, right, of four people, each in their own submarine, and they're going around trying to find their opponent's submarine, right? And they're shouting out the instructions, go left, go right, and having to, to dodge um, islands and, 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 and things like that. Meanwhile, there's someone listening to the, to the uh, instructions that the other team is, is giving away and trying to find out where they might be inside the map, you know, because they, all they know is, is the moves they've made, but they don't know the starting point. But then with sufficient you know, land masses, they might be able to, you know, by elimination, figure out where they are. Meanwhile, there's bits of your submarine that are breaking down and you're, and there's someone trying to repair them and, and whatnot. So um, it sounds amazing. It's like, uh, it's, uh, what do you call it, real time. You know, there's no, there are no turns. It's all happening uh, simultaneously, right? And um, yeah, it seems fantastic. My wife, Brooke, has a fetish for submarines. She loves submarines and everything. But it's just really difficult to get like eight people in your house to play it. And we've just kind of like missed the opportunity in the, the previous game night. So this is definitely one that we want to have at a game day, you know, teach everybody and everything and, and, and open up the, the table here to get like eight people playing because I've heard that it's tremendous fun. This is on my list to definitely try. And you got it, and then we had one game day, and then pandemic. So I, I think it was one. Right, I, I was like we... I was so fired up when when William and Brooke got this game because I wanted to play this game from the moment I heard about it. I was like, oh, I don't, I like, I don't want to buy it because I don't know how many times I'll get this damn thing to the table. And then a problem solved when my friends was bought it, and I, and then then the pandemic, and we don't hang out in person to play, and it just, oh, it sounds so fun. I think you should just do a Captain Sonar day just yeah. fine because really if if i know i could talk my wife into it and your wife with her submarine fetish is already down so we just mm -hmm. need one more couple or even just two individuals and we yeah. got two full teams pretty much yeah so i'm probably the only one who's like uh no i'll play it now don't worry you can count me in i'll, I'll play you know i'm a good sport but as soon as you say real time, I say, that seems stressful. And my life is stressful enough. I don't need more stress. I, in general, and, and you know, there's a couple. I'm um, five-minute dungeon, Andy. Play with you. That was one that I could deal with. Like, okay, I, could, I think this is only five minutes at a time. And he stopped. And there was ways to stop the, the clock. But in general, as soon as you say real time, I'm out. I'm just like, nope, I don't want that stress. Candy I, crush. I I think my wife may also have issues with this game once she plays it as well for the same reason, because I don't, and I don't know, that's what I don't know about it. And that's why I want to play it so much. Cause I don't know how anxiety it, it causing it is because five minute dungeon is brilliant uh, because it takes the anxiety and squishes it into that little window of time. So you'd never feel overwhelmed by it, you know, but um, yeah, I, I, 
I definitely, it's something that I want to try. I don't know if I'm even going to love it. I may not enjoy the experience, but it's definitely, I think, something that's worth trying. Oh, there's also a kind of dexterity aspect to it, yep. because if you're... If I'm you're in that. That's, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Done, you sold it. <laughs> If your submarine breaks down so much that it cannot, like, it's just like, oh my God, you have to resurface, right? And when you resurface, right, you can't take any turns and you have to give away, you give away a lot of information to the other team about where you've resurfaced. I think you basically give away the quadrant, right? And then each person has on their little sheet has a little maze that they have to go through with a pen to, and once they've completed that they can go down to the to, to the to, uh, to underneath the sea again right so you have a little kind of a dexterity game mixed into it so i don't know uh, i just want to hear william yelling at us what what as a captain the dive fire fire I, I think Brooke is going to be the captain. I just, I'm going to be the one listening in, trying to figure out where other people are. I'm going to be the radio operator. Sounds good. I, this, this ticks my, you can vicariously uh, be on a submarine without actually being in a teeny tiny tin can under the water box. Iobound. You're going to, you're, it's a Red Raven game. So Ryan Lockhart does the art, which is amazing. Ryan Lockhart does the game design, which is good. Ryan Lockhart does the publishing, which is great. Ryan Lockhart does the rule books. They're okay. <laughs> it's like, you can't be great at everything. But this one, you're trying to um, you're trying to amass, uh, basically you're moving around to different islands, different ports, trying to get resources and accomplish missions so that you can gain control of those ports so that somebody else that goes there pays you to use the port at the same time. And I always forget the, the game trigger, but you're also building um, a tableau of buildings that give you special abilities and points. Well, the special abilities and points uh, when you triggers end game. So when you get to the, I think it's, Eight, it depends on player count. I think eight at two player uh, buildings, the game ends, but it's, you're moving around. You're actually collecting crew. Those crew allow you to do different things at different ports. And it just becomes a really big engine building where you're also gaining control of those ports. Uh, this one has been on my, my favorites for a very long time. It's the big game of his that we've kept. We've gotten rid of a lot. Um, I like all of his designs, but this one, I keep coming back to. It's just a blast. Well, and this is on my list, too. This is 47. I really enjoy this one, too, because it's got that worker placement aspect that I love. Um, I like moving around the board. And it doesn't feel, the board's not so big that at some games, it feels like it takes you so long to get from one place to another. This one, you can move around quickly enough that you feel like you can do stuff. It's not overwhelming on where you have to go. Some some games, it feels like you spend half your time just trying to get somewhere to do something. And this, you can go pretty quick. So it's a lot of fun. And as Ray said, we've gotten rid of a lot of his bigger games. This is the one we've kept, so. <sighs> okay, yeah, and Ray's gonna complain about this one. But, uh, so this is my Agricola. Um, and we got rid of the full Agricola because Ray doesn't like to feed his people. He, he's miser. I don't know what's wrong with him. Um, but I love this one. I love all the little meeples. And I like arranging my little farm and moving all my um, uh, fences and rearranging them. And uh, I, I just really enjoy it. Like this to me is all the fun of the big Agricola. But it's a nice small package. It's eight turns. So it feels really fast. It, it's, you know, it's condensed. Um, I think the app version of it is really well done as well. Um, I've played that numerous times, and I think that does a really good job. It helps. I, I wouldn't wouldn't want to learn from the app. Um, as some people might, but I would rather have, to me, you have to have already played the game, and then the app is no problem. I would not want to play the app without having played the physical game. 
Um, but I love the rearranging of the things and all the different buildings. And again, you know, and we did by the expansions that give you more cool buildings, which to me is the whole fun of the game. So um, I think if you like Agricola, this is a no brainer if you want the two player version of it. And since we play so many games two players, this made sense for us because um, it just really works and gives me my farming. It's, it's also not as punishing if you don't do everything. You still get penalized, but, you know, in Agricola, if I don't have any horses, whew, give, me, give, me, give me half your points. That, that's an exaggeration, but it, it hits you hard. This one, it's like, you've lost three points. Okay, well, I, I can handle that. Also, I don't mind feeding the people, but if they're living with the pig and I got pigs everywhere else, they can they can kill the pig and feed him himself. I, if I don't have the room that says so, they can still do it. They're farmers. You're living with the pig. Cut off his head, make some bacon. And I guess this one is more like also like tile based maybe, right? Because Agricola has a lot of little wooden pieces and all the fences and everything and, and the cards which can get a bit like, again, like the storage solution, right? You know, all that stuff you need to take out to just for like, just like a two player game. Usually when we play Agricola here, we play just two players, right? But, but it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to take out all that stuff to play, you know? I guess that one streamlined it a bit more. It did, what it really took out was the cards, like all the, you still have all the little fence, all the wooden fences, all the wooden animals, um, but, it did, it's, I think it's the cards. I, I would have to sit down and compare them and I'm sure lots of people know the answer in depth, but I think it's all the cards that are in Agricola that aren't in this one is what they took out. Um, Cause you still have all the little pieces that make it so awesome to see. Mm. Um, and you've still got a little, you know, modular buildings, but it's just smaller scale. Got it. And you said that the app was good because I heard a lot of people complaining about the Agricola app that it's got bugs in it, basically. Sometimes your sheep just disappear, you know? I've never had that happen to me. I'm not saying it can't, but I also don't, I've never tried playing online. I just play against the AI array and I play mm -hmm. pass and play. So it might be that those bugs are in the online game that I haven't played. I've just played the the one, and as I said, it, it works good for me because it did. It took me a while to figure out some of like the mechanisms, like because like in Agricola, you can always rearrange. You can't rearrange your fences, but you can rearrange which animals are in which pens. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to figure out how to get that to happen in the app. You can still do it, but that definitely took me a bit. Like I need to rearrange them, and it might also just be some of that. Like I don't think it's maybe as intuitive. Um, as maybe it needs to be. So mm -hmm. it, it works okay. It's not like the pandemic app. The pandemic app is awful, just awful. Okay. A great game from Mandy. Oh, I love this little sucker. Um, <clears throat> it's from Calliope Games and that most of their games are very light uh, affairs. And so I, I earlier... Um, was passing off Dice Throne as my favorite filler. That I think that was clearly a lie, and this is my favorite filler. Um, it's super straightforward. Everybody has dice. Um, you flip three cards out of the deck that you've shuffled. Each card has a number of points on it based on the difficulty of matching the set. You can lock in your dice uh, on the cards. Some of the cards you only need two numbers to pick up, and those cards are worth small numbers of points. Some of the cards you need to use all six of your dice uh, or and and get six? I want to say it's six. Um, I have it right here. Uh, you have to match all of your dice, so you have to lock them all in, and those ones are worth lots of points, and you can win very easily if you um, if you have all the point, all of the all of the, the points. So like this one is uh, you know, six, you have to get six ones and it's worth 15 points. Um, there's multiple versions of this game out. There's a, a red version, a blue version, and then there's the deluxe edition, which is the one that there's a picture of on the screen there. And I'd highly recommend the deluxe edition. Um, my wife and I have, I believe, three copies of this game. Uh, it is a game that you can play with anyone. It's a game that takes about 15 seconds to explain. 
Uh, and it is a game that is super fun. Like it's a game that when I pull it out, sometimes I'll pull it out to be a filler between we're waiting for the other table at a board game night to finish so we can get into a longer form game. This one's really easy to get out and play and it's over so fast because um, you just have to be the person to get to the most points uh, to it. You know, I think the point total you have to shoot for, I believe is 40 points. Um, and you have to just be the first person to get to it. It's super easy, super fun. Uh, love Letters used to be my go-to filler. Love Letters is fantastic. I love all the versions of Love Letters. Uh, the Batman one is particularly great. The Lord of the Rings one is also really good. This um, is, I think, faster than Love Letters. And I think it's more appealing to more people because you don't have to rely necessarily on the theme of love letters to get people into it. Everybody likes rolling dice. And this is a game that everybody can, can rec well, not everybody likes rolling dice, but if you like rolling dice, this is a good game for you. I think you played it here once again at the end of the, the, the game night and uh, it was just so very pleasant, but the, yeah. it had dragons on it. So <laughs> what was that about? It did. And so the, they have, so the red one and the, the green one are just very simple, um, simple designs. And the, the deluxe edition combines both the red and the green deck into one deck as gold and silver. And they've redid all of the graphic design and it's very art deco and dragons and Greek stuff. Um, and, you know, Pegasus is, uh, and, but, you know, that, that doesn't like, it's one of those games where, oh, wow. Boy. You gotta hold it in front of your face. I know, right? It's gotta go right here, and then you guys can see it. It has a dragon on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I'm in my my daughter's old bedroom, which we converted into an office. So all the walls are purple, which is lovely. Um, but also, uh, you know, northern lights are more pleasant to me than yeah. the purple. But that's just me. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a. I think the graphic design on some of the 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 collector's edition. Or special edition is a little odd. It's kind of weird graphic design, um, but it could be anything. And the, and the basic and we have the app version of it. My wife and I and we play it uh, both with each other and pass and play. And it is just just dead simple. There's not a lot to it. It's it, it which is what makes it such a great filler. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of game that we'll pull out at the end of a game night and we'll play it for a half hour with a group of people. And it also scales really well. It plays really well at three. It plays fantastic at eight. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter how many people you have playing. They have some rules for how many cards you put out um, if you have more people, you know, um, <clears throat> so that it's so that everybody's dice aren't locked in. But it's just fun, and it's it's all RNG, and there's no, you know, you just roll it and you hope you get the right roll, and it's it's just very straightforward and very simple, and it's a good it's a good game to play while you're visiting because it only takes about half your brain to play it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's one that you can just like you know people can just have a conversation while they play you know because and and then just it's that turn they roll they see what happens and then they put it down there. Right? I think it's a great end of the night game, which yeah. is often when I pull it out, um, because we're not not everybody's ready to go home, but no one wants to jump back into Agricola, for example, at that point yeah. in the night. You just don't want to just burn your brain on on that many decisions and that many variables and. Um, I love playing deeper, more complicated games, but they kill conversation. And part of the social aspect of, of the gaming hobby is having conversations with those people that you play the games with. And I think this game really lends itself well to that. Yeah, and I think I've only ever played the app of it, but I think we played in an airport. And again, it's just a great little like, oh, OK, I can hang out and play and, you know, easy and quick to learn. And it's it's a game you could play with your grandma. You know what I mean? Like there's no there's anybody can play it i play this with i play this with a four-year-old it's 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 not a super hard game to play uh, but it is fun and it is challenging and and you know everybody you just enjoy rolling and trying to get that number you know moving on to 12 we got horrified Jenny running with her fleet captains here. Andy bringing out the, the big Godzilla guns in round three, Rising Sun. And then one excellent game, uh, Hive there. Um, horrified. This was a co-op game that surprised me at how well it's implemented. It's one of the first ones that uh, Parsboro Hall did. 
And that design team has a lot of games at Target. And I kept hearing things. I am not a horror movie fan. Like, I, I don't really go for horror, modern horror. But I always enjoyed watching the old ones, the 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 mummy, the wolfman, you know, the original ones, the um, the invisible man, just just like watching them. And so I had to had to pick this up. And this is an excellent, and I'm going to say it: co-op pick up and deliver game. It is not there. The theme is there. You're trying to get this stuff, and you're trying to do certain tasks. But you're really literally going, okay, I got to go pick this up from from the laboratory and run it to the museum so that I can stake Dracula over there and, you know, take out his coffin, his, his first one. So it is a co-op pick up and deliver, and it runs incredibly smoothly. Um, you got three or four monsters you're dealing with. So it, you've got the combination and it depends on what you're trying to do. Each one's just different enough so that it always feels different. And I love this one. This one's really, really good and really accessible. I think it was $35 at, at Target, full price. So I think we, we played it here at uh, Halloween game day, right? Because we, you know, every Halloween, we, we like to host the, the game day here at our house because we go full on Halloween. We've got like smoke machines and whatnot, right? And it was just so pleasant, you know, and... Um, so this was designed by Prospero Hall, right? I think yep. you you guys have quite a few games by by the they're like a designing company, right? They're not like an yep. individual, right? Yeah, they're a team. Um, yeah. They've started. They've really started to try and design things for mass market that are good games. Um, we'll talk about one later, but yeah, they're they're really hitting it out of the park lately. Um, with a lot of their games and most of them end up at target and most of them are in that 30 to $40 range. So very accessible. Fleet captains, not accessible, hard to find big exploration game. Yeah. So I like Star Trek a lot. And so that was kind of a selling point for this one. This is not my typical type of game, but I really enjoy it. Um, it is Star Trek in a box. You've got everything's turned down when you start. Now, first of all, this game is you're going to take 20, 30 minutes to set it up. Okay. And it's going to take your entire table. But you get it all spread out and you are going to have all these tiles face down. And as you explore, you're going to flip them up and stuff's going to happen. And most of it's out of different episodes. You can end up in a black hole. You can end up in a warp. Uh, things go up. It, it's not the same exploding fact that Star Trek Panic is. Star Trek Panic literally is you will be in flames at the end. This one you're shooting at each other and there's the warfare because usually um, the base game plays the Klingons versus the Federation and usually the Klingons have more military you know attacky goals and the Federation has more but there's like a science deck there's a military deck um, and you have these different missions and you've got to get so many victory points by completing missions and some missions are really hard some are fairly simple, but some are much more long ranging. Um, and it's, we get it to the table maybe once a year um, because it is such a long setup. It's a long game to play, but it is a great two player. You can play it four player um, where you're each playing part of it, but it's meant to be a two player game. Um, we do have the like Romulan expansions. So you can play it three player. We've never actually done that, but it'd be fun to do someday. And um, it's just really really cool. Um, it looks really neat on the table with all the different ships out. I'm not great at telling them apart, but you know, uh, I just really enjoy it. And I really enjoy all the different, I think they did a really good job with the theme. Um, and it just, it, it is, if it, it'd be nice if it set up a little bit faster, but then you would lose the randomness of the board. So, you know, that hex system of all the tiles works. But so it's my big, huge one. And we got lucky in that we found all the expansions like after they were out of print, but we found them at a game store in Michigan. Um, and so we were able to get them for MSRP. So that's not typical of how you can find those anymore, but maybe they'll reprint it one day. Um, this was an early WizKids one. So it's got hero click bases on the ships. Um, the disadvantage of it is a lot of the 
the tiles that she's talking about, it's really flimsy paperish cardboard. So there's some, there is some component quality problems, but overall, this is a great game. Um, my large one didn't make my my top 20 list, and a lot of people will, will rage at me. I normally go with uh, War of the Ring if I can, but I like this game a lot. I, I like Fleet Captains. It's it's really enjoyable. It was his 55. See? Top 100. We're good. And now for a large setup time game, Rising Sun. Yeah, I hope you have a weekend for this bad boy. I brought this. I played this at the shop. I played it at my house. I brought this over to your house, William, one time to play. Um, I think this game is um, magnificently designed with beautiful miniatures. And I went all in on the Kickstarter. This is part of Eric Lang has a, a series of games that are based on mythologies of the world that he takes games that influenced him when he was younger and then tries to iterate on them, picking a mythology. So his first game that he did that with was Blood Rage, which was iterated on Viking mythology, which which we'll talk about later um, as, as that's that's well, that's one of my favorite games, period, ever. Um, and this is his game that's based in Japanese uh, mythology and is based a lot on um, this kind of his version of diplomacy a little bit, but not as brutal. It, the diplomacy is very light in this, I think. Uh, it's basically an area control game. Uh, the, every fa it's, it's got something that I, that I love. You'll see it happen again further up in my list where everybody has a every faction has a different set of abilities and plays differently. So it's similar to some of the stuff that you see in like Root, uh, where each faction has a different path to victory. Um, and so you can pick which way you're going to build your faction out. And then there are also these monsters and um, mythological creatures that you recruit as you go through. And depending on how you recruit them, um, and who you ally with. The ally phase is a really big deal, and you can also betray in the middle of an ally, uh, an alliance, uh, and, and screw your partner over uh, to try to get the win, because ultimately only one person can can win the game. Um, I I went all in on all the fancy Kickstarterness, and it was it's a quite it was quite an expensive game for the entire collection. Um, it's really nice. I'm hope I'm still building the uh, broken token Kickstarter my friends got me for Christmas last year, uh, which hopefully will cut down on setup time because this struggles from the same issue that some of the other uh, cool mini or not games that are Eric Lane games where they've just built these beautiful large miniatures. Um, the sculpts are amazing. They're going to be really fun to paint, but uh, they take up a lot of space and you don't always use all of them in a game but you almost always have to get out all of them in a game. And it's two large boxes full of miniatures and tokens. So the setup time is is, is very, very long. Um, it's a game I'm loath to set up if we're only gonna play through one time, uh, just because it takes so long to play. I'll do it because it's, it's fun, but you spend 45 minutes setting up this game, I think easy. Uh, and then, you know, you spend an hour and a half playing it. So, but you know, it's, it's, it's a, it'd be a game that I think would lend itself really well to if you had a dedicated game space or a dedicated gaming table and could leave it set up. Um, Cause it is ostensibly a, an area control type of game where you're controlling and fighting over different parts of Japan. Um, but I think the, the graphic design is beautiful. The theme is wonderful. Um, uh, it, it is one of my top games. The reason it's not higher up my list is the setup time. It's just, it's ridiculous. It's way yeah. longer than it needs to be. I wonder if this is the most vertical game that we have, like the tallest miniatures. No, uh, that's, <laughs> no, is, that is mine, and that is later on the list. I have a. Um, I like these games a lot, William. It's it's a problem, um, and they take up a lot of space. <laughs> You definitely win also the verticality award then of yep. like tallest miniatures, tallest things. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'll introduce you to a friend of mine later. <laughs> uh, I can, I can go if we, if we have a break between now and then I'll go, I'll go pull out my, uh, my, my big green buddy. He's gigantic. Go, go Godzilla. He's actually in the game. Well, no. Godzilla Similar. is in this game and he's fantastic. Similar, but legally distinct. 
from oh, Godzilla. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it does not infringe upon the IP of Godzilla, but it is very clearly Godzilla. Godzilla. <laughs> All right, and William, going for the Hive. Ooh, Great yeah, game. This- yeah, this is uh, fairly old-ish. It came out in the year 2000. So, um, and yeah, and um, again, one of the first games that I played, I think I played it like maybe 2004 or something like that. And the person who introduced me to this game would later on become one of the greatest players in the world. He was runner-up to the world championship uh, a couple of years later. He's my good friend, uh, Dimitri uh, Hebelu. And uh and uh, he's one of the probably one of the top five players in the world. And uh, when the pandemic hit, I was like, maybe I should dedicate myself to a game. And Hive was the one that I, one that I was considering. But the problem is, I started playing with my friend Dimitri, and he just spanked me. You know, it was like not fun for him. I would just like be destroyed. You know, and the thing is, there isn't that much. Oh well, let me talk a bit about the game. Right, this is very much a chess-like game. You know, it's a uh, perfect information. You know, in, in each move, what you can do is either you put down a piece and the pieces are these hexes with a, a bug on, drawn on them, right? Or you can move a piece. And each bug moves in a specific way. What you're trying to do is surround your opponent's uh, uh, queen bee, right? Or have that piece be surrounded by your pieces or by other pieces as well, right? By their own pieces. And at no point when you make a move can you break away the hive. The pieces need to all remain connected, right? You can't have like two islands, right? So it's, it's, it's a perfect information game, very tactical, very strategic, very similar to chess, but there's no board, right? You're just, as you put the pieces down, you are creating the hive, you're creating the board, right? And um, the thing that was, I, was a bit disappointing for me, not the game, but the fact that this is a game that's played competitively. They have like world tournaments and everything, but the amount of resources for you to really dive deep into the game weren't readily available. You know, I have two books on the game, but they're not that great, you know, and the, the internet doesn't have that many resources, whereas Catan is just a wealth of resources if you want to really dedicate yourself to, to playing it competitively. So um, I think it's a great game. It's a game that I've played a lot with, with my wife, Brooke, every time we go to Anchorage. And if we're going to the Lucky Wishbone, the, the wait time for your food to arrive is the perfect wait time for a game of Hive because this also has a pocket edition which the pieces are tiny yep. and small and it fits perfectly on a, on a on a on a table on a on a what you call a coffee table or something like that it doesn't take up too much space so yeah it's it's just a fantastic very deep strategy game that you can really go deep into i think maybe i don't know um, the, the problem that i had as well with with playing this online was that the person who i like to play with is in brazil so there is like uh, four hours of difference and we couldn't quite get to play at the same time. So, and asynchronously, it was just taking too long, you know? So, yeah, but, um, but I think, you know, if anyone's down to play it, I'm always down to play this, you know, it's one of, one of, one of my favorite games. And I would say one of the best games, in my opinion, if I were ranking like in terms of quality, not just do I want to play, but good games, I would put it in my top 10 of best games of all time. Yeah, I would I would agree with that assessment, William. I'm also a fan of pure information games, uh, as as you know. But I, I have my problem with with Hive is, and part of why it didn't make my list is there just aren't a lot of people that I can play it with uh, around. And and I find also it's very much like chess in that uh, it's a game where there's an uneven level of skill, where there are people who have really put some time and thought into this game, and there are people who haven't. And playing this is not a game that I think. It's fun to play casually if the person you're playing casually with is is similar to your level of hive. Right. If they have thought out better strategies and figured out better ways to move their pieces, uh, you're just going to get s- just s- swallowed every time, and and that's not fun every time, right? So it, it's yeah. uh, I think I think it's a but it's a brilliant game. I love that the yep. the board is the pieces. Like that's just it was just. When I played this game, it was so refreshing. It's very different than anything I've ever played, um, and very similar to some games I very much, I very much love. But yeah, I, I think it's definitely top ten easy for me in terms yep. of just 
great games. It is, it is without a doubt a great game. I just wish it had a larger player base. Yeah, we were talking about this before, right? You know, like games like chess or poker that are almost at the fringe of the hobby, right? I think this one's very close to that border as well, where there are people who just dedicate themselves to it. You know, there are books on the game that are, you know, just like chess has books, just like poker has books about it, you know. But yeah. But I, I think pure information games lend themselves to that type of analysis and that depth of analysis, certainly. And taking out... You know, there there's some randomization in the sense of where your opponent places their piece and where you place your piece and which piece you take. But there's also a whole great deal of strategy to it. You know, um, I I think a lot of the the really good classic games like backgammon, for example, has the variability of the dice roll. You know, there's there's good and bad ways to play every dice roll, and it depends on the board state certainly. But I think Hive is much like that, as is chess, where you know you know what can happen. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you know what can happen. Catan also falls into that same yeah. same category for me. So, all right. Okay, moving on to number eleven. Took us a couple hours, but we got through ten. <laughs> Jenny, Caverna, Cave vs. Cave. Andy, we're up to the terraforming Mars. William, we're bringing brass. Birmingham back to the forefront and I'm bringing in the the old school airline era with Pan Am so so uh I've actually played the full Caverna thanks to William because um, they have it we don't own the full Caverna but I really enjoyed that one but Ray and I love Cave versus Cave which is the two-player implementation of it um I like as you build out your your cave you've got in front of you, you've got the different rooms that do different cool things. Um, and it just, again, this is one of those ones that really, I, I love all the different worker placements. I like getting all the actions with all the, the different things. I like that I can build up my little storehouse. Um, and Ray knows which one's not to let me have because I know which two can really make me run away with the game. Um, and he's like, nope, nope, you can't have that one. He'll like handicap himself to keep me from getting both of them. No fun. But anyways, uh, I really um, enjoy this game. Um, I think the full one's great, but for us two player, this is the one we play all the time and we have the expansion as well. And it's just really fun and always a good time. This one's definitely a departure from its base game though. There's There are aspects, but it is... Well, if you take Agricola, all creatures great and small, it's still Agricola, really at its heart. They've taken a couple things out, streamlined it, make it fit in a small box, and you can pull it out and, and set up quick. This one is different. Um, it is definitely different, but I think it's a good kind of different. If I have the time, cave versus cave is probably more, it's more of a sandbox game, more palatable to me than um, Agricola, but this one, we get to the table fairly often. This one's fun. Well, and so it was hard. your 48 race, so definitely you can't say you don't like it. Top 50. So how is it different from the, the, the original Caverna? There's, there's just, they take out all of the, the farm stuff. So you are just the caves. That's all you're dealing with is building up the caves, excavating, getting resources from those caves. So you are getting resources, but they've taken out the farming part of it. Uh, you're right. I feel I, like, I William, it, yeah. you played it here once yeah. with us, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the thing about Caverna is that it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's very similar to Agricola, but it's way more sandboxy. You know, you can just do whatever you want, you know it's a bit bloated. Some people complain that it's bloated. I mean, like, I mean, if you don't want bloat, you just play Agricola, right? C Caverna is like this big, almost like a party game where you do whatever you want. You know, you got to feed your people, but you literally have a currency in the game. You can literally tell them to go to McDonald's. Here, take some money. I'm feeding you money, right? Or you can feed them a ruby, which is, to me, also bizarre. You know, like, eat, eat a ruby. You, know, you, can, you can convert anything into food at any time. So the whole deal is just, like, they will never, ever starve, right? But it's, it's a much heavier and bigger box with tons more stuff, more resources, yeah. more more everything, you know, and you can just do whatever you want, kind of, you know. 
I Ray can, can be his sheep farmer. Carrots. I can I can <laughs> just focus on carrots and I'm good. I can have my carrots and build a cave. I love that there is the cuddle room where you can keep one sheep. I think that's fantastic. Yep. All right. Well, I was going to say, I, I like in, in both games in Agricola and that, that you can have one of your animals live in your house with you. It's like, yep, I can put a horse in it with me. doesn't matter which type. <laughs> You're up, Andy. All right. Uh, Terraforming Mars. I love this game. This game is really well designed. It's really well put together. The only thing I don't like about the game is the, uh, the management of the components in the box itself, which is almost non-existent that and the the player mats um i think the biggest and they and they had a kickstarter that has fixed all of my issues with this game by the way i had to start to resolve them before their kickstarter came out last year um but i if you if you have an older version of this or you haven't looked into the management i would i would say that you should uh you should invest in it because it it cuts down on setup time uh significantly and management of your resources during the game. And the base game comes with these very thin, flimsy, um, you know, card uh, mats where you put all your resources on and slide them around. And uh, also where you track how much of each resource you produce. And so in the base game, you just have these little plastic cubes and there's this mat set up into all these different quadrants. And each quadrant is a different resource. And it's very easy if someone bumps the table uh, or if you accidentally bump your mat when you're reaching across to get uh, a card or to draw a tile, and then suddenly all your resources are, oh, I'm going to make my best guess about where I was here. And that really, to me, kind of messes up the game, especially when it's such a long game. Um, so I, 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 you know, what you're doing is you're terraforming Mars to make it habitable, uh, habitable for, for humans. So you have to balance um, the amount of forest you put which increases the oxygen and you also increase the temperature and um, you basically build a engine it's an engine building type of game <clears throat> but also there's the map of mars that you explore and put cities on and put forests on um, and you know it's 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 loosely based on science like i mean as far as what the what they think the criteria for terraforming mars would actually be or the criteria that you have to reach in the game to to win the game. Um, it, it is a game that has a very slow start in the out of the box uh, game. And I find that the game really starts cooking and is the most fun from the middle of the game towards the end game. So um, I, I would recommend if you, if you have interest in this and you like it, I'd recommend getting the Preludes expansion to go with it because the Preludes expansion gives you new starter corporations and also gives you some boosts that kind of kickstart and eliminate that first third of the game. So you kind of get a little boost up to get through that first very slow slog through. Um, and uh, that, so I'd recommend Preludes and I'd recommend getting some, some management for the box components. Shadows here. Um, yeah, preludes definitely made the game accelerate. Go on. Uh, yeah, and I, I've played this game an awful lot over the last few years, and it uh, it's it's fantastic. And I think it's fantastic. It, one of the things that this game really is is exceptional at is that I haven't found a player count it doesn't shine at. Uh, I think it is least fun for me as a solo game, but it's still fun. And, but I have, uh, we have, we have a couple of friends who this is their favorite game and they play this as a two player game all the time. Uh, but I, it works really well with huge player counts as well. I think it only goes to five if, I, if I'm remembering right. But uh, really well designed, uh, but, but get some management or you're gonna spend forever setting it up. I think this stayed in like the number one game of BGG for quite a long time, right? It did, yeah. I think it was there for two years, maybe longer than that, even. Um, yeah, when it, I, it, it's exceptional. When I played it, uh, the person had the acrylic sheet so that the cubes wouldn't slide around, because maybe one time, one day, we can do a, a top ten uh, pet peeves in game games. And for me, it's not me knocking over my thing because I'm neurotic and I don't knock over my thing, but it's someone else knocking over theirs and winning 
because they put their little token in the wrong place. Do you get me? I'm, I'm, I'm I not, get I you. Have... I'm there, brother. <laughs> And I'm like, this happens with Azul as well. Now they have the crystal mosaic thing where they, you've got the, the little plastic things. But like, you know, like, oh, I just knocked over my little cube that says my victory points. I think it was over here. And then I look at their board. No, it wasn't over there. It was, so you, cut, you don't have that many points. Because if someone cheats and gets away with it, it's their merit. I'm like, okay, I kind of get you. You know, you've cheated. <laughs> that is a valid move in the meta. Do you get me that you cheated, you fooled me, you deserve to win because I need to keep an eye on you, right? But if someone, without knowing, unconsciously, you know, just knocks it over and then thinks that they won, I have to confess that that really pisses me off. You know, it's something I need to work on. Well, it's frustrating. I don't think it's anything you need to, to work on. I, I certainly, I don't know. Uh, my, my nickname with my wife is Spilbo Baggins. So I... <laughs> I would say I'm probably the one guilty of bumping the board. Uh, and I got the management to help myself as much as my friends. Uh, but yeah, that's maddening too. And I, and I can't help but you know apologize if I've been the one who's won a game inadvertently thinking I honestly won it after I knocked the pieces because it certainly could have happened. Uh, but no, yeah, that, I, that's, that's the weakness of this particular game. I, I would remember. I would remember. I don't think it has happened because you know it pisses me off so much. I'm like, no. That you, I don't know if you won that game or not because you knocked over the components. You, Especially I'm for wondering a long if, game if like you, this. Yeah, see, Sorry. now I'm wondering, did I ever do this to, to William? No, Am no. I on his his do-do list for no, this? None, none right. of you are, and whoever is, I will not mention them. <laughs> no. that's, that's kind of you. You're a good man. But yeah, I, I think especially it, it, it really, really hurts in a game like this because this game yeah. can go for like two and a half, three hours if you have a long version of it. You know, if it, especially if you're not playing with the Preludes expansion, it can take a really long time to play this game. And if you're an hour and a half into a two, two and a half hour game and you bump the board and it kind of resets everything and messes everything up, it really, it, it hurts the experience of the game for me, you know? Yep. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's why it's not higher up my list because out of the box, the management is just miserable and I have an issue with that. Brass Birmingham. Coming back to Euros. So yeah, so this is, I guess, a, a, a different version of the original Brass, right? Which was uh, done by Martin Wallace. I think then he, yeah, that was a classic Euro that came out, I can't remember when, I don't have it written down here. But then he did two new versions. There was Brass Lancashire, which was, I think, more similar to the original Brass, and then Brass Birmingham, which introduced a few uh, uh, newer things. And this one is considered the better version, Brass Birmingham. So this, you're, it's basically you're there in the, in, during the Industrial Revolution. You're trying to build industries and you're trying to make money. You're you know, a captain of industry and that kind of thing. And uh, it's fairly heavy. It's got like a steep learning curve because has a few complicated concepts because you're, you're building industries on a map and then you're linking them with railroads, but then there are the railroads that you own, but then there are railroads that other people own. And when those intersect, you can actually use other people's railroads, but it depends on what you're transporting. Very fiddly at the beginning, you know, for you to like really uh, uh, internalize those rules. But once you get that down, once you like, uh, you, you really grok the rules. It's such a, a really pleasant game, you know, of just a bit of a bit of area control and network building and resource management. You're, you're playing on your turn. You just basically do two actions, which uh, you play two cards to do two actions, and you're basically trying to score as many points as you can by producing. The the interesting thing is that you can produce fa create factories which you then sell the goods to get victory points, right? That's one way. The other way is to produce resources on the board that everyone else can use. And that's the cool thing about the game is that you can make a coal industry or a, or a coal factory or a metal factory, an iron factory or, or a beer brewery that belong to you, but everyone can use those resources if those resources can flow along the network in the, the correct way. 
So sometimes you're not building something for you, you're building something because you know that there is a demand for it in the market, in the game. So you're really playing with everyone. It's, it's, it's not a solitaire game. It's a Euro game, but you're very much looking at what people need to supply that and then to get rich off of that, you know? So the artwork is also beautiful and well, it's polarizing because it's quite grim as you can see from the cover there it's quite grim and uh, but it's the kind of aesthetics that that we like here in, in our household and just very solid heavy euro if you're into like a very heavy euro very thinky you know with a lot of um, yeah pretty pretty much perfect information almost you know the only variability is the the cards that you get in your hand which show different locations where you can just you know, place an industry down. But other than that, you know, very much a perfect information game almost, you know. And so, yeah, it's a great game. The only problem is it's, it's super heavy, you know. So you really have to have people who are willing to, to climb that, that learning curve. All right, fine. You bring the heavy, I bring the light. But we do have a light euro here. Uh, this is again from Prospero Hall. This is a, a Target one and it's Pan Am. And one thing about Pan Am is, you know, my background's aviation, aviation safety. And um, Pan Am, uh, the game was, I, I watched some reviews on the Dice Tower and a couple other places. And I said, might as well pick it up. It's only $35. And I've played the heck out of this one. Now we've had it for a year, probably over a year now. Um, and just played the heck out of it, two player. And then William came over during a time frame when when we when we were were safe, but we were able to to pull it off. We played it three player, and that changed the way the game played. And that that pushed it up on my on my opinion. And it was just great. You've got set collecting for your resources. You got to get cards like Ticket to Ride. You're trying to get cards to get your roots so that if you've got, uh, you know, one uh, hub and you're trying to put out hubs and you're literally trying to have your airlines get bought up by Pan Am as they expand, because then you get money to buy Pan Am shares. You win by having Pan Am shares. So you're trying to lose your company, but you got to keep enough money in your company to buy the Pan Am shares you need. And it's a worker placement. There's lots of things. You're putting out uh, flights for different routes. You need a bigger plane for a bigger route. And then when Pan Am buys a bigger route, you get more money that you then pay ba Pan Am. It's, it's actually a really, really well thought out game, again, by Prospero Hall, that is light enough that I think anyone, it's accessible to anyone, but it's a good way to introduce people to Euros, but it's still a really solid, fun game. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed playing it. It was, yeah, very solid. Like I said, like a, almost like a perfect gateway game. You know, it's really remarkable that this kind of stuff is being sold on Target. You know, this, you know, fairly light for the for mm -hmm. your typical Euro, you know, but, but still, you know, it's really great to see the direction that the hobby is going. Yeah. Well, and this is my 26. I really like it as well. And I think it was a shock for both of us on how good it was, you know. Um, and it was also a shock because it would have played two-player, almost in three-player. Oh, you really see how the competition? Because two-player, you don't really pay for a lot. It's not that big. Three-player, oh, you're going to – and I can see at four-player, it could get quite vicious Is because only one person gets to build an airport every round. And I could see, you know, money all of a sudden becoming an issue. Um, I also like that, you know, there's an Alaskan city, Alaskan ride on the, the map. And that, that's cool in its own little way because usually we're not represented. So it's it's neat. Uh, but, yeah, it's a great little uh, introductory euro. Yeah, even Rio de Janeiro is represented, which is good. All right, I'm going to stop here and then we'll start again.